Okay. Welcome. And we'll, yeah, and we'll officially begin uh, with our core coffee chat this morning, where really we get to hear about funding practices that build trust, capacity, impact, and equity from the point of view of people and agencies that apply for grants or funding. And so we're gonna use the term grantees for short. Hopefully you've actually been successful in applying for and getting grants, um, but we also wanna hear if, if anybody has had that experience where you keep applying and, and still don't get those grants and because uh, that could be a valuable lesson too in terms of what it is about the process that might uh, be improved. And so, um, in case any of you haven't met us before, I'm Nicole Young, and I'm joined by my co-host, Nicole Lezen. And together we are the consulting team, the lead consultants that facilitate something called the Collective of Results and Evidence-Based Investments, or Core Investments, which really is a countywide initiative, uh, collective impact approach to achieve equitable health and well-being for all people across lifespan in Santa Cruz County. And I'll say more about that in a moment. But first, again, uh, just a quick review of how to participate on Zoom today for anyone, anybody that's new to Zoom or uh, needs a little refresher. So we are providing simultaneous interpretation today. Um, and you know, for those of us that are speaking in English, Stella, our interpreter is translating into Spanish. Uh, we invite people to um, speak and contribute and ask questions and share in Spanish, and Stella can interpret uh, for us into English as well. So we, it's important to make sure that you're on the right language channel. So the way to do that is to click the globe icon in your Zoom meeting window, and you should see a little menu up here. <laughs> Select either English or Spanish, so pick one channel or the other. If you select Spanish, then we recommend that you also uh, click silence or mute original audio so that you only hear the interpreter. So I'll give you a moment just to make sure everybody's on the right language channel. If you need any help at any point or if the interpretation channel isn't working for you, feel free to send a chat in English to Nicole Lezen or in Spanish to Gisela and we'll try to help you out um, the best we can. Um, and just another thing too, because Stella will, she has the ability to switch back and forth to interpret into either language for us. Um, just give her, give us a little heads up if you wanna say something in English or Spanish, just say, I have a question or uh, tengo una pregunta, just so that gives enough of a heads up for Stella to switch her, her language channel. Uh, and then you can also um, share your feedback with us using the reactions button on the meeting control bar. That's also how you can raise your hand to let us know that you wanna be called on, that you have something to say. And you may have noticed that we have closed captioning turned on. Uh, if you do not wanna see the subtitles, which are in English only, click on the CC icon and choose hide subtitle. And again, we encourage you to uh, share your comments and questions throughout this whole session in the chat. Um, so at this point, we're actually going to invite you to introduce yourselves in the chat. So click on the speech bubble icon and show your name and the group or organization you're representing today. And by group, that could mean, you know, um, a community member group, or if you're an independent child care provider or a parent leader and don't really feel like you belong to a specific organization, uh, share that in the chat as well. Okay, so it's good to see, again, some uh, familiar faces and names in the chat. Welcome, everybody. I'm gonna move on now to say a little bit about core investments, again, for those of you that uh, may be joining us for the first time today. So again, core stands for the Collective of Results and Evidence-Based Investments. And we think of it as both a funding model and a movement to achieve equitable health and well-being in Santa Cruz County. And we do this using a results-based collective impact approach that's responsive to community needs. And so through a, you know, a long process, ongoing process really of gathering input and feedback from many community partners like yourselves from nonprofits and public agencies and grassroots community groups, we've arrived at these mission and vision statements for that describe what CORE is you know, about collective action and creating an equitable, thriving, resilient community 
uh, with equity, again, front and center. And when we talk about equitable health and well-being, really we refer to this graphic and this concept of creating the core conditions for health and well-being. So that again, for every member of our community from you know, across the lifespan, um, that everyone has equitable opportunities to experience these eight interconnected, interdependent uh, conditions for health and well-being, that we all need house safe you know, stable, affordable housing and shelter. We need opportunities for lifelong learning and education that's very often tied to economic security and mobility, um, that we need to have a sense of belonging and community connectedness, that that very much linked to uh, living in safe and just communities. And so to create these core conditions for health and well-being in a way that um, our, you know, health outcomes or our opportunities in life aren't determined for better or worse by things like race, ethnicity, gender identity, immigration status, and, and other kind of social characteristics that we really need to look at and examine how our programs and our practices and our policies and our systems are either structured in a way that, that support and foster equitable health and well-being or actually serve as the barriers uh, to that. And so that's what we try to do in these events like this, like these core coffee chats, which are part of what we call the Core Institute for Innovation and Impact. Um, and think of the Core Institute really as a container for holding an array of training and technical assistance and other learning opportunities. Again, for people from nonprofits, the public sector, grassroots groups, eventually the business community. Uh, and really our goal is to build the knowledge and skills and systems needed to fulfill our collective vision of an equitable, thriving, resilient community. At this point, I'll turn it over to Nicole Lezen. Thanks, Nicole, and welcome, everyone. Today's topic about funding practices that increase trust, capacity, impact, and equity is one that's always of interest to us, but particularly now that COVID has accelerated uh, some of the changes that were already underway and how funders look at their own roles, particularly in advancing racial equity. And there's been a lot of change and, and flex in the dynamic between funders and grantees. So we wanted to host this discussion, partly because we know that a lot of local funders, including the county and city of Santa Cruz, are starting to plan for upcoming funding processes and would find the input from grantees, like many of you on this call, really helpful. So today's discussion has that context, but is not specific to the county's funding process or the city's funding process or any specific funder. But we do hope that the ideas and themes that we talk about today will be of general interest to all local and regional funders um, and to grantees. Today is about grantees though. So we wanna hear from you and as applicants for funding, from your perspectives, we'll pose some questions to you. And we know there are some funders on the call. We're happy to have you, but we hope that you'll, you'll be observers and listeners and that we'll get to hear from the grantees first. We, we do have a similar session planned for, for this summer where we'll hear more directly from funders as well. So in order to hear from as many of you as possible in the time that we have together, we thought it would be helpful to have some group agreements. Of course, we wanna create a space where people feel comfortable being really honest about their experiences and their expectations and hopes and concerns. But part of making that possible is asking everyone to keep their feedback as constructive as possible. Um, the idea is to learn from each other about what's possible and, and hopefully spark some change. We won't get there if this turns into a complete venting session. Um, we really do not want this to be about funder bashing. Please don't call out individual funders by name in our discussion today. That's just not what this is about. Even though, of course, there are frustrations and specific situations, but we do uh, really wanna keep this constructive for everyone's sake. And again, not just for this conversation, but in general, we hope that everyone can give each other the benefit of the doubt, not assuming bad intent, even if something feels um, difficult to absorb or, or to listen to. And we ask that everyone share the air. So if you're the person who jumps in first um, with a comment, 
maybe this is a time to hang back a little bit and let others shine. But if you're the one who hangs back, maybe you want to be a little braver and jump in. So we want to make room for all of you. Um, but please don't take it personally if we move on from comments. If you can keep your stories and examples brief so that we can hear from as many of you as possible, that would be really helpful to us as facilitators as well. And so since we've named our session uh, the grantee perspectives on funding practices, we just want to add another reminder to center those experiences today. And um, we'll, we'll look forward to hearing lots of examples from you. So anything to add to these or any questions about these before we dive in? Does this, does this feel like something we can all live with for the next 45 minutes or so? Okay, let us know in the chat or by, I think we have a couple raised hands as well. Thumbs up. Okay, great. Thanks. So now that we've got these agreements in place, let's see what we can learn about who's on the call. So Nicole's going to launch a poll. And we're asking you to let us know whether you're here as a grantee or someone who usually is in the applicant for funding role or a funder. Some of you might be both, depending on the situation. Are you an interested observer, a community member, or something we haven't captured here? So we'll give everybody a minute. Looks like about half of you have voted. And we'll wait for a few more to come in. I think that's it. So I'm going to end it and share the results. Okay. Great. So you can see we have a mix, but about half of you, the largest segment, are grantees or applicants for funding, as intended. So thanks. Okay, so for those of you who said you're grantees, roughly how many grants do you apply for each year? One to five, six to 10, or more than 10, you're doing pretty much one a month. Okay, again, we'll give those a chance to wander in. Um, so this might be most of the grantees by now. Yeah, so again, a mix. Um, most of you, five or fewer, but a couple of you still in some high volume grantee territory. And even one to five per year, depending on um, what they are, is still a lot. Um, we both know from, from doing that ourselves that even a supposedly short streamlined application still takes a lot of the same steps as a, a longer, more elaborate one. So it's still a lot of effort. Okay, thanks for answering that one. And then we're assuming that because you're on this call, you probably do have some specific ideas for improving the funding process all the way through. So are you in the yes, bring it on, I can't wait to share them category, or yes, I have some ideas, but I'm not quite sure how to make them operational or specific, put them into action, or not yet really just in listening mode. And this is for everybody to answer, not just the grantees. Some of you are still thinking about it. Okay, I'm gonna end the poll in about two seconds. There we go. Okay, so once again, a mix. We've got some of you with specific ideas and we'll get to hear those in just a moment. We've got some kind of contemplating some things, but maybe, maybe this conversation will help you think about how to make those more specific and actionable. And we certainly hope so. 
And then the largest category is in listening mode. So hopefully we'll, we'll all learn something today and maybe this entire conversation will spark some more specific ideas. So thanks for that. Okay, so with that background, we thought it would be great to have a conversation among us. We have some specific questions to pose to you, but I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so that we can see each other. And that'll make it easier for us to see if you've got your hand raised or wanna jump in as well. So Nicole, we ready? Yeah, let's go for it. Okay, and we would actually love it if, um, or we wanna encourage you to turn your cameras on for this discussion so we can see the humans behind the, the video tiles. Of course, we'll understand if you need to leave yours off, um, but it also helps to kind of build that sense of uh, communication and, and community. So thank you all for turning your cameras on. Um, we wanted to, before we get to the, the, you know, the hard parts and the suggestions for improvements, we actually want to start off asking uh, or inviting everybody to share your examples of like the best funding process you've ever experienced. Um, and again, thinking primarily about from a grantee perspective, if you have been in that position of applying for funding or a grant, like what, what's the best experience you've ever had as a grantee? And again, because our theme is really funding practices that build trust, capacity, impact, equity, you know, think about what are the things from beginning to end that made you feel like, ah, there's some kind of relationship that's being built there between me as a grantee and, and the funder, or, well, I really feel like this process is different and is really um, you know, in line with the values that the funder may have expressed around equity and, and um, you know, improving outcomes for, for all in the community. So tell us, and again, you can share in the chat if you wanna um, share your ideas there but also we welcome anybody that would like to unmute themselves to share something out loud. What's been your best experience? One that just made you feel like, ah, oh, either that felt really good or, ah, oh, I don't, <laughs> that wasn't as bad as I thought, or that wasn't absolutely terrible. Anybody have good examples? Be anything from the maybe the types of questions that were asked or the way they were asked. I'm seeing Melissa share in the chat when funders modified the application processes in the midst of COVID. Yeah. And is that is it safe to assume, Melissa, that you're um, saying that like the process was made easier or simplified in recognition of the challenges that, that everybody was experiencing during COVID. Kaki shared in the chat, working with the Packard Foundation's consultant as we put together a planning grant, it offered us the grant after sending a four page summary or description. Yeah, so it's always nice when, you know, when there's that communication even before an application process starts that, you know, when it, when it feels like the funder is actually helping set you up for success versus like waiting for you to <laughs> miss something or, you know, fail somehow. So that's always nice when, when uh, there's that experience. Lori, did you have a comment? writing a general operating support grant, we're often writing the same information to different funders answering slightly different questions, but um, one funder allowed us to submit an application to a different foundation, to their foundation, didn't even have to swap out the names or anything or answer, you know, the same questions in a different way. And it really streamlined our process, but still allowed us to share really what was going on in our organization. Lori, we had that experience too. It's really wonderful when that happens. I see that Miguel has asked what kinds of grants or funds we're talking about. Miguel, for there, we're talking about applications to a, a funder of services or um, capacity building for nonprofits or, or public agencies. 
So something like a, a foundation or a government agency that is funding some local efforts. I see that um, Teresa has shared a couple comments in the chat that there are some local giving circles where you get to give an in-person presentation about your organization and programs. So that's, that's uh, often a really nice option to have, right? To be able to, um, you know, showcase your work and showcase your, the best parts of your organization in a format other than a written proposal because, um, you know, depending on whether you have the skills as a grant writer or the resources to hire one, not everybody, you know, has access to that. And so being able to find creative ways to highlight your work and the impact that you, uh, that you have is a really helpful option and can be one of those strategies um, to create more equitable funding processes, right? That it doesn't automatically kind of create more advantage for some organizations versus others. And uh, so another comment later from Teresa in the chat about a funder here in Santa Cruz County that recently changed their format to a one pager that allowed uh, the applicants to give a concise description and ask, which is another really creative, um, you know, option. And sometimes, you know, it just kind of reinforces that more isn't always better. <laughs> sometimes more just makes things, you know, more in terms of like lengthier applications or more complex questions sometimes just makes that makes it more difficult, not only for the grantee, the applicants, right, to complete it, prepare it, but on, you know, on the other end, it can make it harder for funders to you know, sort through it or to really understand you know, what is being uh, shared. So yeah, it's, it's great to see those examples of you know, how do you really boil down the essence of what you do in a way that's going to uh, be understandable and compelling right, to someone else that's reading it. Some other comments coming through, Nicole, do you wanna jump in and did you see anything that, was, that stands out to you? Well, I was just gonna offer the example of the Oregon Community Foundation that for very small grants um, under a certain amount, asked people to send in a haiku. And so, and then they had a contest where people voted on it and they got so many creative entries. Um, so, you know, things like, we serve homeless vets, but our building is hard to find. We need a sign, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. Um, so let's see. Carolyn's sharing, you know, best experience, local funder who gave a grant without requiring a new application. And it was, that decision was made based on past experience and the relationship with the organization. That's a real show, right? A real sign of that trust that's been built, right? That they uh, would make that funding award based on their previous experience with an organization. Yeah, so not having to prove yourself over and over again and feeling like there is a track record that means something. Well, Melissa is sharing again, a funder that offered support from a professional grant writer to help edit their impact statements. Yeah, amazing and super duper helpful. Yes, and that's the kind of thing that can help you not just with that funder, but others as well, because a lot of those materials are things that you would use in multiple situations. So, very helpful. Cool, you wanna move on to the next question? Yeah, so we've heard about these positive experiences and of course they have a flip side. So we wanna know What's your most difficult experience with a funding process as an applicant or a grantee? What, what got in the way of the things we're talking about, of building trust? What made you concerned that the process was reinforcing inequities perhaps, or made you feel that, that it was set up so that your agency didn't really get to shine the way that you know it could? What, what are the things that got in the way, the barriers that made things difficult um, for you? Or questions, maybe it's something that made you cry or want to tear your hair out or let out a terrible groan sitting at your computer one night. We've all had those moments. Um, I can say this has been a few years, but I once worked on a very large federal grant that was due January 2nd. So it basically ruined the holidays of everybody who applied for it. And it just felt like 
that agency had a lot of discretion about when they could have made it due and they deliberately chose that date, which was pretty awful. So what about you guys? What What's on your minds as those, those moments where things could have been really different? And, and remember, we're not gonna bash a specific funder, but we just want the examples um, as cautionary tales, or things to avoid. Okay. I know you have them. <laughs> I'll add one, Nicole. This is Elisa. Okay. Hi, Lisa. Hi. Um, so I think that um, speaking to sort of the expectations around the timelines, I find that with funders, there's so much urgency for the applicants. Um, to get things in on time, you know, there's no wiggle room. Um, often the turnover is six weeks or less. And then you wait six months um, to, you know, hear back, to get a contract, to, have, you know, I don't know. I just, I feel like that it's a little bit of an unfair expectation um, for grantees to kind of turn on a dime and then we're kind of stuck waiting. Mm -hmm. Very hard to plan. If you put in, put in a proposal, you want to set aside the time and the bandwidth to do something, but you can't because it's stretched out. Yeah, great, great point. Thanks. Uh, I want to tag on to that. Okay, Carolyn. That, that is such a great point. At least I didn't think of it automatically, but I really do wonder why the application, what's the... Um, you know, rationale behind the application period being so brief. So, you know, when the when the application opens, it's yeah, it could be three, four weeks. Like, what? I don't understand that from the funders' perspective um, mm -hmm. in terms of their timeline and and the pressure that it puts on the applicants. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks for highlighting that. What are, what are some other things that you wish were different from past experience? Can you place yourself in that, that moment where you just wish you had a way to make a suggestion for something that really got in your way of, of putting your best foot forward? Um, Melissa, Melissa has got in the chat the competitive performance outcome criteria while also wanting total collaboration and sharing of databases between agencies applying for the same grant. Tiny word counts. Yeah, those are, those are difficult. How about when you find out that a word count is actually a character count? <laughs> Get the scissors out. Yeah. Uh, Lori is saying lack of transparency around major changes, consider longer rollout timelines for those changes to allow times for, for grantees to adapt. Yeah, that's a great point, Lori, thanks. So just uh, um, getting back to the timing issue of um, the, the unevenness of the timing that's imposed on, on grantees versus the timing that may, may be happening on the other end. It's more stretched out. Okay. Any others come to mind? Okay. I'll, I'll share too. Like I, I feel like I'm pretty. Um, <laughs> I like to think of myself as pretty smart and like can read, you know, pretty complex things. And yet there are times when I look at, you know, RFP instructions, you know, fund request for funding proposal instructions, or the way that questions are worded. And I'm like. I'm not sure I know what this means. Like, how am I supposed to answer? I'm gonna, you know, kind of do my best at like putting together a bunch of words that, that I hope are, you know, answering the, the right question and you know, cross my fingers. But there are sometimes where it seems, especially um, feels like the bigger the grant, sometimes the more complex it is and the harder it is to actually, you know, figure out is this, you know, aligned with what the funding is, uh, is intended for, or what's gonna make it competitive and stand out. Uh, but yeah, a lot of technical words or jargon that just don't feel necessary. That can be one of those things that feel that can feel like, oh, is the funder trying to actually make it hard for people to <laughs> apply mm -hmm. and successfully get the funding because that's their way of, you know, weeding people or applications out. 
Yeah, I think I see a lot of nodding. Um, you're reminding me, Nicole, of also um, asking for the same information in different ways. So that's particularly frustrating when there's a word or page count, as there so often is, and it just feels like, wait, we just told you what our mission was or why, why this is important. And now you're asking for it in a different way. Um, so that, you know, it sometimes feels like the committees that write these things are not reading their own stuff. <laughs> so, okay. Um, oh, and Carolyn, yes, the financial parallels to that too. The financial information instructions can be pretty murky um, or they're just different terminology for different things. Definitely have seen more uh, moving towards kind of basic budgets as opposed to these much more elaborate ones. But Lori's saying when the questions aren't clear, it can leave the grant writer guessing, what do you really mean? What information do you really want here? Yeah, that guessing game is not a good feeling, is it? Just, I hope this is the right thing, as Nicole said. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna give it my best shot, but anybody's guess what this is really about. Not having upfront and clear reporting criteria and requirements. Yes, that's so at the other end, even after you, we've been talking about applying for the grant, but after you get it, then you know what are you what are you being asked to tell about what you've done? Okay. Thanks for those responses. Anybody else? All right. Nicole, should we move on to our next question? Sure. And so, you know, we're interested in hearing, you know, just more specific examples, if anybody can think of any, about what you consider to be effective, equitable, innovative approaches to funding processes. So again, it could be something that you've experienced directly or that you saw another funder doing that maybe you didn't apply for that particular grant, but you thought, oh, that's interesting, or oh, wow, that really feels in line with my organization's values, or wow, that's a good example of that funder, you know, walking the talk in terms of um, equity and, and equitable funding processes. We're curious, you know, we do a lot of our own kind of trying to learn about that and, and kind of scanning and seeing what other funders are doing because we're in a position, you know, through CORE where we can share ideas um, with other local funders and, um, Hope that, that we see some of those elements appear in, in funding processes, but we're curious to hear from all of you if, if there are specific strategies or examples that you find particularly effective. Today says sharing, we appreciate when funds can be used for general operating or where the funds are needed most because it gives more flexibility to be innovative. Mm -hmm. What about um, going back to that timeline issue for a moment, you know, and, and some of you talking about how, you know, it can be really challenging when there's, when it feels like there's an unrealistic time frame that's given for preparing a proposal and submitting it. What, what does feel reasonable or what have you experienced that has felt like, okay, that's, that's a reasonable, doable timeline? Anything more than a month? Yeah, I think um, what I think works well is the letter of interest process. You know, I think if you can um, gauge both from the applicant side and the funder side, if it's a good match, and then you understand kind of what the timeline is going to be, it can kind of help you to ramp up. So you spend a few hours on a letter of interest, see if that's a good fit. And you know that if you're selected, then you would have this much more time to prepare that second application. Um, and you can start thinking about it and, and you know ramping up for it, but you also, if it doesn't happen, you haven't wasted a lot of time. So that works well. I mean, it feels like a two-step process, but it in some ways helps with that. Yeah, especially if it's um, you know an interactive process. <clears throat> where the letter of, in, of interest isn't just then, 
either read and acted on or, or rejected, but there, it actually serves as that, you know, opening for the funder and, and applicant to um, talk about alignment and, and fit and, and how it might be refined before you invest the additional time, right, to prepare that full proposal. Yeah, I would, I would completely agree with that, Elisa. I'm seeing some other comments here about, you know, uh, typically a month is, is okay, but, but better if it's more, especially if it's a complex application, you know, six weeks rather than three to four weeks. Um, you know, especially I would imagine if it's, or I know I found from my own experience, especially if it's a collaborative application, right? It's one thing to like try to get your, <laughs> Get yourself together within your own organization and and make sure that the appropriate staff that you work with are all on the same page and sometimes even that you know when grant grants have to happen like this sometimes even that's hard to do within your own agency but if it's like you know a collaborative proposal where you need to make sure that there's some shared agreements about what you're even applying for and proposing yeah all of that takes time Melissa's agreeing, yes, the letter of, of interest is really helpful, can save a lot of time. Trying to bring in consultants to the grant takes time. Yeah. And then just the time to even, you know, write it, draft it, review it, do some quality checks, not only for, you know, spelling and grammar and does this make sense, but, you know, is it, is it telling a compelling story? Um, that's going to grab a, a reviewer's interest and does it clearly communicate and convey you know, what you think that you are proposing to do? What about, we're particularly interested in, if any of you have experiences or, or just observations about you know, what equitable funding practices look like. We hear more and more funders talking about you know, trying to do that internal reflection, looking at their own processes and, you know, are there very, are there things about the way that they issue requests for proposals or award, you know, grants that um, actually contribute to or perpetuate some of those inequities that as a funder, they're really interested in uh, minimizing or eliminating. Uh, so we hear, you know, we, we see a lot of um, kind of articles and reports from other funders about steps that they're trying to take internally to live up to their values of equity. But we also hear funders, including some locally, you know, that are also asking themselves, well, what does that actually mean? What does that actually look like in practice as a funder? What do we need to, what would we have to change or do differently? How does that get experienced by the applicant? We're curious, do any of you have good examples or, or thoughts about what that looks like? Carolyn is sharing, the Arts Council has done a lot in this area, uh, using Spanish language applications, doing outreach to Watsonville, looking at their budget allocation in terms of equity. Yeah, those are, those are some good concrete examples of what equitable funding practices look like. And then this says adding to be more equitable, um, greater outreach and grant writing support would be helpful. Yeah, so that again, those organizations that maybe already are really experienced in grant writing or have the funds to hire grant writers are not automatically kind of advantaged over other organizations that don't have those same resources. Kaki is saying really listen to grantees and other community actors about how the issues are showing up causes and then being willing to fund that, uh, especially if it means funding kind of those smaller nascent organizations that maybe don't have that, you know, years long track record or history of uh, demonstrating results, but um, right, every organization has to start somewhere. And so uh, one way to kind of demonstrate or, or uh, implement funding practices that are equitable is to commit resources to funding those smaller organizations that are building up their capacity. Funders should be willing to fund administration costs that are necessary for good grant writing and reporting. Yes, that's often the piece that gets overlooked. And then that's where we can find ourselves, you know, months later going, why did I ever apply for this grant? <laughs> um, I, um, I have another example of um, 
I mean, pretty amazing large state agency, the California Arts Council, that has done just some really incredible work around equity and um, now, um, you know, having every organization that applies um, have a racial equity, um, you know, an equity statement that's adopted by their board and also in their applications, asking about how the organization's internal and external practices and policies, um, you know, are, I don't know how, how they word that, but include equitable, um, include equity in their practices and policies. So they have some great resources on their website. Um, and I don't know, I've just been very impressed with, you know, how a state agency like that really took it, took it on and um, has been, you know, walking the talk there. That's great. Thanks for sharing that, Carolyn. Um, would you be willing to put the name of that state agency in the chat or send it to us later? Because that would be, I think we'll be really interested in looking at some of the resources they offer and sharing those with other local funders that might be able to, might, might be looking for examples to draw from. Okay, I see some other comments in the chat in response to that question. Thank you for all of those. Um, Nicole, I think maybe we should move on to the, the next set of questions. Absolutely, yep. So we, we know that at least some of you had some specific ideas you couldn't wait to share. Maybe you've already shared them, um, but and maybe some others have been sparked for you as you've been listening. But we, we're really interested in what a dream funding process would look like for you as a grantee. So this could be everything from start to finish, hearing about it, applying for it, getting the contract, reporting on your, your work. What, what are your ideas for improving all of that, um, any of that or all of it? Is it something, it doesn't have to be something you've experienced necessarily, but something you've wondered about or dreamed about. Um, what, 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 do you, what do you wish were the case um, with these different steps? We're handing you the magic wand right now. So let us know. Um, Isabel says, honoring oral traditions by having the possibility to submit video letters of intent, videos of intent. <laughs> Great, thank you. What are some other ideas you have? And thanks, Carolyn, for putting the Arts Council in the chat. We'll, we'll definitely take a look at that. Do you ever find yourself, um, for example, reading an application and thinking, if only they would ask us this, if only they would ask us about X, Y, or Z? It's, um, it's hard to think about specifically how to fix some of these things that are, that are frustrating or feel that they're not doing the job of letting us tell our stories. But if you do have ideas, so Carolyn's mentioning a common application, um, extending the funding period past a year, per preferably five years, unrestricting funding so that it's, there aren't so many strings attached, uh, avoiding line item budgets, how about a, a percentage of support um, to fund a, a significant chunk, like 50% for a small organization, Um, a half hour conversation instead of a letter of intent where the community organization gets to tell their story. Okay, keep those ideas coming. What, what, what else is on your minds? Uh, reporting requirements that use existing databases, so not creating something anew. Okay, thanks for that one, Lisa. Do we have any questions or suggestions specifically from our Spanish channel? Stella, perhaps you could alert us if there are any questions. No, no, okay, thanks for checking. And Lori's mentioning um, providing feedback 
yes, to, sometimes you, you have to ask for it, but just whether they're successful or not, it help, really helping us understand what we're doing well, where we can improve as applicants. Um, the, the perspective of, of funders is really valuable to helping us understand how other funders might receive our applications. Great point. Again, the grant writing support, so the specialized skill of how to pitch something, how to, I think of it as a combination of project management and marketing, really. So you have to be able to understand how, how to describe something, what the, how all the moving parts fit together. Um, renewing funding after a brief conversation to ensure that there's still alignment of goals and values. Yep, so really just trying to, um, to get at the essence of something without a lot of extra telling, reporting, description, especially when there's something in place already. There was an earlier comment too, Nicole, in the chat about having the executed agreements in place before the beginning of the grant period. Ah. Which I've had that happen too with grants yeah. where like you, you prepare the proposal and the budget and the scope of work thinking, okay, it's gonna start. <laughs> this day, so we can accomplish this. And then the contract doesn't actually start until like two or three months in. So you're like right out the gate behind. <laughs> That's never a good feeling. That's so true. Yeah. Michelle's talking about uh, multiple year grants with reporting in person, more creative applications to showcase work, such as the one pager done by a local funder. Seeing a lot of pluses there. So that one pager is a great example. Are there other things that you personally have noticed as, um, as changes over the past year? Some of them were in response to COVID, but not necessarily. What, what, else, what else strikes you as adaptations that have been particularly helpful? Somebody mentioned earlier the, the uh, specialized writing help with crafting an impact statement. Uh, moving to unrestricted funding, fewer strings attached. Okay. While you're pondering that, so sometimes it's helpful just as the funders, I, th I think really try to put themselves in grantees shoes and applicant shoes. Maybe we as grantees also can put ourselves in, in uh, funder shoes. So what do you imagine the funder, funding community is struggling with right now. If you, know, if you were in their shoes, what would you be thinking about as challenges or ways to make this process better for everybody? Do you have any insights about that as applicants? I'm just calling out Carolyn mentioning the uh, collaborations among funders, so City Arts and the Arts Council. Yep, just as grantees collaborate, sometimes funders do too. So any, anybody wants to put on, any grantees want to put on their funder for a minute hat and think about what that might be like? Um, Melissa is saying, I'd be thinking about what pots of money were available and the restrictions. So, so taking a, a look at that internally. Okay. Anybody else? I I was just going to say that I, I often think that the, um, you know, our colleagues who we work with uh, to talk about the work that we're doing, you know, our kind of peer um, funder colleagues are not ultimately the ones making the decisions and they are often our, our advocates, um, mm -hmm. but that the decision making is being done by board directors of folks who don't really know us. And it puts a lot of pressure, I can imagine, on the program staff who are, um, you know, fighting for their grantees. And, and so I think some of those structures um, are, are challenging and kind of how philanthropy mm -hmm. and foundations have been structured. Um, it's, it doesn't feel very, like the, the work is grassroots, but the decision-making is very kind of patriarchal or kind of like old school institutional. So I think those things are, are, are in tension with each other. Okay, that's a great point, Elisa. Yes, yeah, so sometimes the hierarchy top-down decision-making is at odds with the, the way that the information is gathered or, or assessed on the ground. Um, 
Teresa is imagining that convening a board or a committee for the selection process is time consuming or can be time consuming and hard to schedule, absolutely. Um, and, and when you do that, if you don't have an established board that, that's routinely making decisions, then there's the issue of how you deal with different levels of time commitment and effort and familiarity with the process and what kinds of reviewing rubrics and tools you're going to offer people. So yeah, there's a, there's a lot behind that as well. Try and get, get some consistent input and decision making. Um, Lori's imagining that it's really hard to decide on grant amounts. Absolutely. So if you give lots of smaller grants, you can fund more organizations, spread a little joy. But from the grantees perspective, take just as much work to request, steward, and report on a small $2,500 grant as it does a $25,000 grant, absolutely true. And it adds a lot of admin work to grantees that could be better applied to programs. Always a conundrum. Yeah, we see that a lot. Well, a lot of imagination of putting yourself in yourselves in funders shoes and and a fair amount of sympathy for the some of the dilemmas on on the other side of the funding equation and of course some of you we know on this call are funders and some of you are in multiple roles as occasionally grantees and occasionally funders as well so a lot of insights there actually makes me wonder nicole like mm -hmm. um when all of you think about the different funders and funding sources that you you know get receive funding from. Um, do you feel like you know what your what those funders are thinking and what their thought process is or what their concerns or rationale might be for doing things different ways? Or do you feel or does it feel like more like, yeah, in general it's a mystery. <laughs> mm -hmm. And that's part of the challenge. Imagine it depends on the funder. And we've asked you not to be specific about funders, but mm -hmm. yeah, it depends. Some yes, definitely others no. Yeah, so maybe for the ones where there's where it's murky about what, what the funder is really after, what, how they're looking at things, what criteria they're using, you know, something that helps that, uh, helps clarify that, some contact or um, conversation that sometimes there are, these initial Q and A type webinars, but you know, I don't know about you, but in my experience, those aren't always very informative. They're kind of somebody reading slides from that are basically taken from an RFP. There's a lot of um, caution about answering questions in a certain way or encouraging this or discouraging that. So Carolyn's saying she's found funders to be very open to personal contacts and conversation. That's true. So sometimes it's very formal and no, we can't talk about that. Or we can't talk to you outside of this setting, but other times there's a lot more give and take and a lot more um, openness to understanding in both directions. So, and sometimes that's not up to the grantee to ask for. Sometimes it's set up, um, you know, with the visits you've all talked about or more informal sessions um, with a lot more give and take. So it can be done. Are there any examples that you want to share in our last few minutes here before we close out that you'd, you'd like each other to know about, you'd like us to be collecting? And I would, I would just say before we officially close out, please keep those coming. If you are applying for something in the next month or two and you think about this conversation and something that you wish uh, you had been able to raise because it occurred to you in that middle of the night moment before the deadline, uh, please do forward it to us. We would love to keep collecting these ideas and stories um, with an eye towards improving this for everybody. Nicole, I'll turn it back to you. Okay, so we are winding down and we would love to get your feedback about today's session. We're gonna use the poll within Zoom to get your, your feedback instead of the SurveyMonkey link. Um, and so if you could all just take a moment to tell us, you know, give us your feedback about the informal, interactive nature of this session. 
Um, do you feel like you learned concepts and skills that are useful and relevant to your work, whether it's paid or volunteer work? Are you likely to use the concepts and, and information and, and we didn't really talk about specific skills today, but kind of the concepts and information we, we discussed today. And then overall, how satisfied were you with this coffee chat today and how likely are you to participate in future coffee chats? We'd also love to know what language, what language channel you participated on today. And again, we're just asking for the purpose of this so we can match all the information together kind of what role you're participating in as today. And so there are seven questions in this poll. You have to answer all of them before you're able to submit your answers. And so depending on what kind of device you're on, you might have to scroll your mouse or scroll your through your smartphone or whatever device you're using to see all the questions. So we'll keep that up for a couple more minutes. And in the meantime, we'll tell you about some upcoming events. So we are taking a break from the coffee chats next week. So nothing on Tuesday the 4th, uh, but instead we have uh, the fifth session of the ACEs Aware Network of Care Learning Series that First Five Santa Cruz hosts in collaboration with CORE. We, we support those events. Um, and it's on building and strengthening network connections. So Gisela, I, I believe has posted the registration link in the chat if you haven't registered for that already. And then the week of May 10th, we actually are, are supporting and participating in two different events. So we'll be guest speakers, Nicole Les and I will be guest speakers in a training on data share Santa Cruz County on May 10th. And then the next day we'll use our usual Tuesday morning as kind of like an open office hours um, on data share. So if anybody either missed the training or they participated in the training but still have questions, want some hands-on practice on how to find data, how to build reports, how to create your own dashboard with data, how to navigate around in the core results menu, we'll just have an open discussion uh, kind of like this where we'll just see what kinds of questions come up um, and talk through it and, and do hands-on practice. And so again, we, we're asking everyone to, that would like to participate in the office hours to actually register just so we have an idea of who's coming. <laughs> and thank you all for being here, for contributing your thoughts and, and your ideas. Um, Colin, I see your question about receiving an invite for the May 10th. We will um, send that out as well. I think that's in the chat. Gisela, can you post that again? the registration link for the May 10th training and go ahead and do the May 11th office hours again. Carolyn, I'm, I'm chuckling over your boomer zoomer. <laughs> it auto corrected because oh I, because I am a boomer, but you know, you know yeah. everyone else is zoomers. So <laughs> <laughs> it's possible to be both. Yes, we could we could do a whole session on autocorrect stories, couldn't we? <laughs> okay, that's it for us today. We will stay on for a few more minutes in case anyone has uh, other questions or wants to share some um, off the record thoughts. We'll stop our recording. And uh, but for the rest of you, if you need to move on to something else, we hope to see you at a future event. Yeah, thank thanks for all these examples. Um, we did have somebody privately wonder if. People might have shared more if this had been just grantees, no doubt. But we try to be inclusive in our in our chats, and we think um, you there are other opportunities for preventing and for um, maybe having more pointed comments about about funders. Um, we just didn't feel like that was the way to go today. That's not what this was about. So I, I hope you did. Uh, whether you're a grantee or a funder. Uh, learn something useful or ha have some ideas to suggest. Um, none of this is easy, but we, we would like to be um, helping to share ideas to make this a better process, um, especially concerning the equity and, and trust issues that were raised. So we hope this will move us along, um, even if it's smaller steps than some would like. We there's plenty of work to be done and, and starting some of some funders have already started as you've explained and some have a ways to go and I think we can help accelerate some of those changes too. So thank you for participating. And if there's a particular thing 
that you didn't feel comfortable sharing um, either in the chat or live, feel free to send it along and we'll do our best to absorb it and, and share it in a form that it can be received. So thanks for that.